Hi everyone, here's Anthony on the Sunday afternoon uh, talking about the passive voice. I've been thinking about the passive a lot recently and I thought I'd share some of my thoughts with you about why exactly we choose the passive over the active voice in conversation and in writing uh, more particularly. And I'd like to do that by exploring some real life examples and looking at how to get at the passive in class through texts. I'd like to give credit where it's due at the beginning, Scott Thornbury, for an excellent blog post, P is for Passive, um, and also for his work on this area in his book on Discourse Analysis Beyond the Sentence, which I highly recommend. Now, moving on, here's a headline, OAP Savaged by Killer Dog. If we read this in the newspaper, and this is a contrived example, I, I wrote this myself, um, I must admit, but it will illustrate a few points. OAP savaged by killer dog. OAP old age pensioner. We've got a subject there. We've got an action. Savaging is going on. And we've got an agent or a perpetrator. The killer dog. Now, as we read on, this is what we see. A large dog bit a pensioner in the neck outside Tesco on Saturday while he was trying to stop it from attacking his grandchild. The man was taken to a nearby hospital with severe bite wounds. The animal has been captured and put down. The owner has been identified and charged. I hope you'll agree that that is a reasonably authentic sounding um, short news in brief article. If we look at it, we start in the active, a large dog bit a pensioner in the neck, and we remain in the uh, in the active while he was trying to stop it from attacking his grandchild. Now in the second paragraph there's a shift. The man was taken to a nearby hospital with severe bite wounds. The animal has been captured and put down. The owner has been identified and charged. Why this shift from the active to the passive? Well there are some classic explanations for this that I'd like to present and debunk. We often hear we use the passive when we don't know who did it. Somehow the agent is hidden from view. Well, if that's the case, the owner has been identified and charged makes no sense because we of course know who identified and charged the owner. It will be the police. Um, then we've got the argument who did it isn't important. And of course, when we look at this example, the animal has been captured and put down, we can see that that's complete nonsense because it is very important who goes around capturing and putting down animals um, in society. And we certainly hope that it was the authorities, the police, the RSPCA, someone actually entitled and empowered to do so, not a vigilante. So who did it is actually jolly important, even if it isn't stated. Uh, we want to hide who did it is another common uh, argument and when we look at the example the man was taken to a nearby hospital we can see that that doesn't make any sense because why would we hide the ambulance services in this case the thing doesn't make any sense now I know what you're going to say Anthony you're cherry-picking your examples and you're building up a straw man argument well I challenge you take any of those examples of the passive and test them against any of those three uh, explanations for the passive and you won't find a fair reasonable example. We don't know who did it, the animal has been captured and put down, yes we do, the authorities. Um, we want to hide who did it, the owner has been identified and charged, why do we want, why would we want to hide the police? Um, we want to hide who did it, the animal has been captured and put down, why would we? Why would we want to disguise the fact that the RSPCA or the police have done their job? Uh, we want to hide who did it, the owner has been identified and charged. We have a secret police, do we? Um, no, I don't think so. The thing just doesn't wash. Now here's something that does wash. Voice, active or passive, is first and foremost a means by which we maintain theme and ream in our utterances. Now theme and ream is basically just the way we manage to place already given information towards the start of an utterance and place newly given information towards the end of an utterance. Now there's a good cognitive reason for this. It makes it easier for us to follow what somebody's saying if 
and the beginning of each new utterance or each new proposition is based or rooted somehow in stuff we know or we have been told or is a given. And then we move from that secure ground of shared knowledge to the new information that the speaker writer is providing us with. And this is the driver whenever you have a linear transmission system like speech is and like grammar supports to place what's known at the beginning and what's new towards the end. Now we can flout this rule but it very very powerfully explains why we place some things at the end, some things at the beginning and therefore have to make a choice between active and passive voice. Let's take this idea, this rule, for a test drive through a lesson. To give you a bit of background, I was teaching an intensive course B2C1 level a few weeks back and I'd had a bit of an accident in the classroom. There were these blinds that came down out of the ceiling and I'd managed to trap them uh, with the windows and cause all manner of damage. So the students came in in the morning to see me up a ladder trying to fix this problem. It was all very embarrassing, we had a good laugh. Anyway, I went home and lo and behold, while I was looking for something else, I saw that that day was also the anniversary of another major disaster, much more significant one, the Hindenburg disaster. The Hindenburg, you'll remember, was an airship and uh, it looked like this. I thought it was quite interesting that I'd had a disaster of slightly smaller proportions on the same day as this historical disaster that was important in Germany, where I work. And then I noticed on my teaching schedule that I was due to teach the passive the next day. Well, my teacher brain started putting two and two together. And the next day I went into class, put this picture of the Hindenburg, which I got from Wikipedia, on the whiteboard, drew next to it a sketch of a window, and put the, day, the date of the day before up on the board and asked the students to work out what the connection was. They actually managed to do it. I presented them with the Wikipedia article and asked them to read it quickly and find one or two facts that were new to them that they didn't know before, because they were obviously somewhat familiar with the story, but not experts. After they'd read it, I extracted these four sentences and I asked them to identify how the LZ129 Hindenburg uh, was named throughout the text, find um, references to it. And this is what they found a large German commercial passenger carrying rigid airship, it, the airship, it, Hindenburg, etc. So once we've established all of those references, I also ask them to just confirm, in each of those cases, is the Hindenburg the subject of the sentence or the object of the sentence? And in each case they said, well, it's the subject. Then once we'd established that, I asked them, in all of the sentences, why would you say the writer makes the Hindenburg the subject of each sentence? Is it because it's the most important information in the sentence? Is it because it's the newest information in the sentence? Is it because it's the actor or the doer in the sentence? Or is it because it's in the subject position because it's the known or the already known information in the sentence, in the text? Known or already given, I should say. Now, when the students were doing this, they initially started to try to apply case-by-case -case explanations. So they'd look at the first case and they'd ascribe A, B, C or D to it, and then they'd try to ascribe a different explanation to one of the others. This was reflecting, I think, their prior teaching or, or prior teaching experience relating to the passive, where you look at each example and you try and find one of the three, four, or six uh, sub-rules given for using the passive that apply to it. But they were somewhat flummoxed when I said to them, no, 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 I want you to find one rule to rule them all. Which one of these four, A, B, C, or D, adequately explains all examples here? And when they were asked to do that, they very quickly started to realize that when they really thought about it, um, none of the others were adequate descriptions except D. It, once we established that, we could move on and say, well, is the known or already given thing also the agent or not? 
Is it doing the action that follows? Or is it receiving the action that follows? So we place something in subject position because it's already already been established. But once we've done that, we have to make a decision. Is the verb we're moving on to, is the action we're moving on to, something that the, the subject does or something that happens to it? And that's really all there is to deciding whether or not to make a verb form passive or active. We take what's already given, the secure ground for, uh, for comprehension, and then we just have to make a binary choice. Is it the doer or is it the receiver? And then the passive is driven by that, or the active, one way or the other. So once the students got their heads around that idea, we had to practice it. I asked them to choose between option A and option B to complete a, an encyclopedia entry about the Apollo 11 moon landing in a way that worked the best. So the sentence, the first person to set foot on the moon was Neil Armstrong, which makes the best uh, follow-up. He led the Apollo 11 mission, or the Apollo 11 mission was led by him. Well, he led the Apollo 11 mission would make both, most sense because Neil Armstrong is the given. The Apollo 11 mission hasn't been mentioned yet, so it doesn't fit as well as the subject of the sentence. We could do it. There's no two ways about that, but the chances are we wouldn't. Then we move on and say Armstrong collected rocks from the moon's surface. Now, A, scientists all over the world have studied these rocks, or B, these rocks have been studied by scientists all over the world. B is more likely because rocks has been established in the previous sentence. Armstrong collected rocks, and the scientists, if we started the sentence with them in subject position, have just quite literally come in from outer space. They've been nowhere up to now. Why do they deserve to be the given? Moving on. Armstrong left scientific instruments on the moon. These instruments sent information to the Earth. Information was sent to the Earth by the instruments. Here, clearly, Example A, these instruments send information to the Earth in the active voice, makes better sense than B because the instruments is established and they are the agent, hence the active voice. We could choose the passive, we could take B, but it would be exceedingly odd. Neil Armstrong took the first camera footage of someone on the moon. Here we've got an interesting example. We've got Neil Armstrong and we've got someone on the moon. Now from that point of view we have two people who are given, and then we've got a very fine choice to make. We could say the Apollo 11 mission leader, Neil Armstrong, filmed Buzz Aldrin as he stepped onto the moon. We could say Buzz Aldrin was filmed as he stepped onto the moon. Both of them are quite likely because both the Apollo 11 mission leader, Neil Armstrong, and Buzz Aldrin are givens in the light of the previous sentence. But my students agreed that as Neil Armstrong was such a heavy feature of emphasis in the text up to now, A, they felt was more likely than B. And I think that they had good reasons for saying that. After that was clear, I gave them this topic. I wanted them to write a short encyclopedia entry on something they know, know something about, technical process, an invention, a historical event, something like that. I asked them to introduce the topic in their first sentence, then add any, any information that they could, and if they didn't know something factual, they could invent it, make it up. I wanted them to try to keep whatever the reader knows at the front of the sentence and choose between active and passive voice as they go along to help them do this. So that's my take on teaching the passive and what the passive is really all about in relation to the active. I'd be interested to hear what you think of this. And for further reading, I recommend Scott Thornbury's 2010 blog post, P is for Passive, there's the URL. And also I strongly recommend his book from 2005, Beyond the Sentence, which is excellent for clarifying theme and ream much better than I have today. Thanks a lot. This is Anthony Gordon from teachertrainingunplugged.com.